Good evening and welcome to our Bible study and prayer time this Wednesday night in January. Uh, we're glad that you are joining us in this way and uh, we desire uh, to be in the presence of the Lord, uh, to be under the hearing of his word and to come together, uniting our hearts in prayer to the Lord. We have a wonderful promise uh, from God's word that when we pray together, that there is great power. And uh, oh, we need to pray together. Uh, we need to pray for, for one another. We need to pray for our nation. We need to pray for our church. And we need to pray that God would use us for his glory and for his kingdom. So I'm glad that you're going to join us tonight in prayer. And so I encourage you to, to stay with us for that time and uh, to, to join your heart with ours. As we come into the Lord's presence, uh, we do so with praise and thanksgiving. That is where prayer begins. We want to praise Him and to thank Him for all that He's done for us. And then we're going to spend some time listening to Him from His Word. To call us into an attitude of prayer and praise, I want to read to you from Exodus chapter 15. This song to the Lord, let it be our own. For I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. He has thrown the horse and the rider into the sea. For the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. Would you join me in a, in a prayer of thanksgiving uh, this evening as we begin our time together. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for the revelation you have given to us of yourself that we might know you. And Lord, we, we know you are the Lord of hosts, that you are the mighty warrior, and that you protect us and provide for us. And Lord, you have provided this great salvation. We praise you for it tonight. We thank you for your protection of us in these days and lord we ask that you would be with us we want to hear from you and so tonight as we open your word to uh to to discover who you are lord i pray that your holy spirit would reveal our need to pursue you every day that we might follow you with our whole hearts Lord, as we come before you in prayer, we're thankful that you hear our prayers. That through your Son and through his sacrifice, you have made a way for us to enter through the veil into the Holy of Holies. And so, Lord, that wherever we are tonight, as we gather in spirit and in truth, that we would recognize that we are in your presence. Lord, we thank you for all of these things and, and so many more. We come before you with great gratitude in our hearts. We thank you for your word. As we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So we want to spend some time tonight listening. And, and in that desire, we're doing a study on these Wednesday nights through the book of Exodus. And so tonight I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 3. And we're going to read of probably some of the most familiar parts of this book as we look at the calling of Moses. And as we read this text tonight, uh, I want to maybe change what typically is our focus in this passage. We're often looking closely at what's going on with Moses and, and recognizing this as the calling of Moses. But I would ask us tonight to really look at this text as the revelation of God. Like God is revealing himself to Moses, but through Moses, God's revealing himself to us. That we might know him. Consider his condensation. Consider the fact that he's coming down. That we might know him. And so let us seek to know him tonight as we read his word. We're going to read the first 15 verses and then come back and, um, and, and just um, do an exposition and application. And we hope at the same time as we work through these 15 verses of chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. 
Meanwhile, Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. As Moses looked, he saw that the bush was on fire, but was not consumed. So Moses thought, I must go over and look at this remarkable sight. Why isn't the bush burning up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses. Here I am, he answered. Do not come closer, he said. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he continued, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt, and I have heard them crying out. Because of their oppressors, and I know about their sufferings. I've come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from the land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The territory of the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. And the Israelites cry for help. Their cry for help has come to me, and I have also seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh, so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses asked God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And he answered, I will certainly be with you, And this will be the sign to you that I have sent you. When you bring the people out of Egypt, you will all worship God at this mountain. Then Moses asked God, If I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the Israelites. Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is how I am to be remembered in every generation. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. If you're following along tonight and and taking notes, uh, basic outline as as I work through uh, this passage would begin with the revelation of the name. We want to see that that's the central message and teaching from, from this text. So I want to talk a little bit about the sacredness and the significance of his name. And then, as we begin to do an exposition working through the passage, we'll uh, we'll break it up this way. First of all, as we talk about that Yahweh is a personal God, He is a present God, He's revealing Himself as a purposeful God and a powerful God. So, uh, we'll, we'll look at it in this way. God reveals Himself to Moses, and in that revelation, He reveals His name. In Isaiah 42, 8, the Lord says, I am the Lord Yahweh. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to any graven images. As we look at this revelation of God through the burning bush, we hear for the first time given the covenant name for us. Now, it's not the first time that the covenant name of God is used in Scripture. We can go all the way back to the garden, and we hear it used there. Uh, In Genesis chapter 4, and verse 1, it says, And Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. And she said, With the help of the Lord Yahweh, 
I have brought forth a man. And later she gave birth to her brother, Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain was a worker of the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of his fruits of the soil as an offering to Yahweh. And so, all the way going back to uh, really after, just after the expulsion from the Garden of Eden, we hear Eve, and then we hear the sons of Eve using the name of God. Most Bible scholars would agree that the expected pronunciation is the one I've just used, Yahweh. Um, the reason <clears throat> for this, that the name uh, is uncertain, I'm, I'm going to explain in just a minute, but what I do want you to know is that this name is used um, some 5,300 times in the Old Testament, making it the most frequent name for God used in the Bible. Most translations uh, will distinguish the name. If they don't use the name Yahweh in the translation, they will distinguish it with the word LORD uh, in all caps. Well, you'll, you'll notice that as you read along in the Scriptures, and it'll be the LORD said... But if you see it in all caps, it's because there the covenant name is, God, is used. Yahweh is used in the scriptures three times more than Elohim, uh, which is a more general name uh, for God in the scriptures. Um, here, as he reveals himself to Moses, he describes his name and the meaning of his name when he says I am who I am and that in the original Hebrew language is is uh, the very most of the same letters as Yahweh I am that I am he is self-existent he is personal he is engaged he is the same yesterday today and forever this is who he describes himself as when he gives Moses his name. Consider the sacredness of that name. Originally, as Moses would write these first five books of the Bible, and when he would write the covenant name of God, he would write it with, with four consonants. And if we were to transliterate it into English, it would be Y W. Uh, no, excuse me, Y-H-W-H. -H. Now, the Jews consider the name so holy that they would not pronounce it uh, when they would read the Scriptures. When they would come to the covenant name of God, they would uh, supplement verbally Adonai, which means Lord. They would not use the name. They would not speak the name of God because they held it as sacred and they would not profane his name. And understand this. For example, if you were in the armed services and you were a private in the armed services and you came to address a senior, maybe a commander, when you addressed them, you would not use their first name. You would not work, walk up to your lieutenant or captain and say, hey, Bob, how you doing? No, you would address them by their title because to address them by their name would be to put yourself at their level. Now, in much the same way, the Jews would understand the sacredness of the name of God, that they would not address God by his covenant name. They would address him Adonai, Lord, the Lord. Um, the only time uh, historians would tell us, biblical historians would tell us, the only time that God's name was pronounced aloud was on the Day of Atonement. And it was used in that, sac in that time of sacrifice and in that ceremony that his name was used. Now, uh, you, you might wonder, because uh, quite often we might use the name Jehovah as the name of God, where does that word or name come from? Well, I, I've told you a bit earlier that the, the Hebrew language 
up until the third century before Christ, was written, in its written form, only contained consonants. In the third century before Christ, uh, a group of Hebrew scholars in Alexandria took the Hebrew text and added vowels to make it easier uh, for people to learn the language. This is during the diaspora when the Jews have been scattered around the world and as far as Babylon to Egypt. And in their Sabbath schools, they're, they're teaching and trying to retain their language, though most of the Jews are now speaking a different language because they're in different nations and countries and cultures. And so to make it easier to learn the language, they felt the need to add the vowels. And so they did so by adding little dots and lines uh, to, to put the vowels into the words. Well, when the scribes came to the covenant name of God, because for them it was so sacred, they, they, they did not add the vowels of the covenant name. They took the vowels from Adonai, or Adonai and they put them uh, within the consonants of Yahweh. And when you pronounce that together, you get Jehovah. So in reality, Jehovah is not the name God gave to Moses, but it is a name that we can use uh, to speak uh, and, and to, with, with that understanding that it is a combination of the Lord, Yahweh. Now, the sacredness of the name. Just one other, just one other item. When the scribes would copy the scriptures. Of course, they did this by hand for generation after generation until the printing press. Uh, when the Jewish scribes would copy the scriptures, and when they came to the name, the covenant name of God, they would stop. They would go through a ritual purification, and then they would take a new pen to write the name of God, and after they finished that name, they would destroy the pen. Simply to emphasize how sacred they recognize the name of God to be. What a far cry from how God's name is used in our day. We are too casual with his name. We don't hesitate to pronounce it. We use it flippantly. As uh, a matter of fact, it's worked its way into our slang. People use his name to curse. And I, I would simply remind you that the third commandment tells us that we are to never misuse the name of the Lord. We're never to treat it as empty or without value. Of course, I think our lack of respect for God's name stems from our lack of respect for God himself for his person. This may be simply because we do not know him for who he is. God has revealed himself to us that we might know him. We might know his holiness. We might know his power. We need to consider the sacredness of his name as we would consider the significance of his name. For Moses, I would remind you, he's been wandering, and our text says he's on the far side of the desert, or I like the King James Version, it said he's on the back side of the desert, tending his father-in-law's sheep. He's out in the middle of nowhere, wandering, no sense of purpose, adrift. Have you ever been there? A time in your life where you feel like there's you're not sure where you're at or what you're doing or what your purpose is. I mean, this is where Moses was. And we remember his story. You know, Moses begins as a somebody. He is the son of the, uh, the princess of Pharaoh. He is a somebody, but God has now sent him out of the backside of the wilderness to recognize that he's a nobody so that God can make him into somebody. Yahweh knows what's going on in Moses' life. And he's been at work in Moses' life to bring him to this place 
Now, it's taken a long time. Right? He was 40 years in Egypt. Now he's been 40 years out in uh, the backside of nowhere, watching over his father-in-law's sheep. But for the Lord, I would remind you, time it doesn't mean the same to him as it does to us. 40 hours, 40 days, 40 weeks, 40 years. He knows where you are, what you're thinking, and what you're feeling. Oftentimes, as with Moses, he's waiting for us to come to the end of ourselves where he can begin a new work in you. Let's consider some things about the Lord. How he's revealing himself as personal, present, purposeful, powerful. Moses sees this great sight. God took him into the wilderness to prepare him, that he might lead Israel, to, that he might humble Moses to teach him to put his trust in God alone. Or maybe it's the 40 years in the wilderness was to take, the, take Egypt out of Moses so that he could use him. But after these 40 years, he's ready. Israel's desperate. Pharaoh's heart is hard. God is able so God enters. He gets Moses' attention through a, a burning bush that, that burns, but is not consumed. It's interesting to consider how God reveals himself here. Certainly he could have handled this in many different ways. Um, but he chooses to draw Moses to himself. Right? He doesn't... <laughs> He doesn't jump out from behind a corner. He doesn't scare Moses. He draws him to himself. He orchestrates the circumstances so that Moses would respond, that he would leave what he was doing and that he would come to God. Now, notice that you know, the text tells us that it's already referred to as the, the mountain of God. So maybe Moses came looking but however, whatever was in the heart of Moses, when he saw the sight, he makes the decision to stop what he was doing, to turn from what he was doing, and to go and see this great sight. I would say for you and I, we would recognize that God is a personal God, that he comes to us, to our person. He comes and draws us to himself, much like he does Moses he often orchestrates circumstances in our lives to bring us to a place where He can speak to us, where He can reveal to us His plan, His glory. God still calls people to Himself today. He is in control. It is by His choice that He calls us, for He is holy and you see that in his, in his revelation. Because as Moses now comes, as he turns to come and see this sight, God speaks to him and says, Do not come closer, verse 5, remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Yahweh reveals himself as holy ground. He is self-sufficient, but he's holy. He doesn't let a self-willed person enter into his presence without recognition of who he is. Moses drew close, but before he could become familiar with God, God stops him, requires him to, to remove his sandals, to take off his shoes as a sign of the recognition of God's presence. One of the things that sticks out to me as I consider that story is that if you want to step into God's presence, if you want to discover His will, then you're going to have to step out of the direction you're going. You have to repent. You have to turn. If you want to step into His presence, then you're going to have to step out of your comfort zones. 
the things that make you feel safe or secure, you step out of them to step into his holiness. You must do it in humility. It's amazing how often we think that we have something of value to offer to God. Many people think that their plans and their ideas are something that God wants. And so God has to humble us and instill within us a sense of holy awe, of reverence and humility. For Yahweh is present. Look back with me, if you would, to verse 7. And the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt, and I have heard them crying out because of their oppressors. I know about their sufferings. I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from that land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. God knows. He's present. He's aware This was a difficult concept for the people of Moses' day. They were led to believe by the many cultures and religious ideas of the day that there are many gods. The nations of the world were pantheists. But God reveals himself as the God, the only God. He's not a regional God. And this is something we'll see throughout the book of Exodus, is God is constantly reminding Uh, those who would follow him, that he is not a regional God, that he is the God of the whole world. That he is everywhere. He's omnipotent. And that we're to worship him alone. The Jews have lived in Egypt for a long time. And they had begun to think like the Egyptians thought. God is revealing that he is faithful, is faithful to his promises, that we can trust him. And like Israel, we need to be reminded that living like the world, that adopting the attitudes and the, uh, the, the, the vision or the idea of the world of, that, that is carried around us will lead us into misery. Yet we see God's grace in this story. That despite the compromise of the Jews that were living in Israel, God still remained faithful to his chosen people. And though sin had overwhelmed them with grief, he heard their cries and he redeems them to himself. For you and I, we need to remember that God knows every detail of your life. And whatever it takes to bring you to the place where you are desperate for Him alone, God will bring you there. Maybe it's through discipline, hardship, difficulty. But His desire is to bless you. God knew the truth. God knows the truth. He knew as long as the Israelites loved Egypt that they would never love Him. So he allows the penalty of their sin, the the effect of their sin, to bring them to a place of misery and desperation so that they had no place to turn but to him. No matter how far away you feel you are from God, he is present. He is near you now. He's revealed that about himself. He's present. He's also purposeful. Verse 10, God says, Therefore go, I am sending you to Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. This is one of my favorite parts of the story. For God here is describing his own heart. He is setting before Moses his plan. That he has a plan to redeem the nation of Israel by his power. 
And as God's describing it, you might imagine that Moses would be excited to agree with God's plan. And then when Moses informs, or when God informs Moses that his plan requires Moses to go in his name, Moses doesn't respond very well, does he? He says, who am I? I can't do that. But God's call is specific, as it is purposeful. He has a plan, and has a purpose, and in his plan and in his purpose, he chooses to use human agency. He chooses to use you and I for his purposes. And they are specific. There's a specific call being given to Moses. Just as he would specifically call you. That he might use you for his redemptive plans. To save a world that does not know him. To share the gospel. To minister his love and his grace to those around you. God does not act by our wishes or our timetables, but by his own. It's, and he works in purpose, but he works in power. Let's go on reading verse 11. But Moses asked God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And he answered, I will certainly be with you, and this will be the sign to you that I have sent you. And when the people, when you bring the people out of Egypt, you will all worship God at this mountain. Then Moses asked God, if I'm to go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What, do I, what should I tell them? And God replies to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And I'd also said to Moses, say this to the Israelites, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is how I am to be remembered in every generation. I, I want you to see, and we'll, next week as we continue on in the story, we'll, we'll see it a bit more clearly, that when God calls us, he also gives us everything that we need to fulfill his purposes in our life. That we might live godly lives, that we might live as his ambassador, that we might fulfill his purposes. He gives us power. He gives us the provision. We need to succeed. Paul, writing this to the Philippians, says, Then my God will meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And this is still true today for you and I. For ultimately following God is putting our trust in Him alone. And it boils down to the question, do we believe that God is who He says He is? Do we believe that God will do what He says He will do? Do we trust that He is the self-existent One? That all of life and history is truly in His hands and under His care? For if we believe these things, then we trust him. And when he sends us, we're willing to go. For his name reminds us, I am who I am. That he is life, that he is present, that he's personal, that he's powerful, that he's purposeful. And we can trust him. And it all begins with you believing that God is large and in charge. That when you accept His truth, you can trust that He's going to guide your life and He's going to empower you to live for Him. So tonight we remember that with thanksgiving. As we remember that, we, we look and consider the, the way we have been viewing our circumstances. And it might be that the circumstances of this year or this day has caused us to fear and to be afraid. 
And the reality, the reason for our worry and our fear, our anxiety, is because we're not focused on who God is. The reason we begin to give, make excuses for why we're not serving him is because we are not focused on who God is, that we're following this pattern of Moses who fears because he doesn't know whether he believes God or not. Do you believe God? If so, then understand that he is in charge, that he is on the throne, and that you can trust him. Would you join me tonight as we pray? Heavenly Father, we come tonight uh, recognizing that so often we have been, we've allowed the fears of this and the cares of this world to infiltrate our hearts. That we've lived in Egypt so long that we've loved Egypt more than we've loved you. Lord, we would repent of that tonight. And that we'd ask by your grace that you take Egypt out of our hearts. That we'd pursue you. That we'd come to you and recognize that we are in a holy place. Lord, we want to reverence your name as we trust you. We take you by your word. Lord, we repent of of the petty, uh, the pettiness of our life, and uh, Lord, how we've, how we've ignored what you're doing in our day. Right now, we confess that you are Lord. And we believe that you are who you say you are. We believe that you will do what you said you will do. And so we trust you with our whole lives. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We have reason to, to pray together tonight, to pray for uh, one another, to pray for our nation. And so we want to take time to do that together, to agree together in prayer. I'm going to ask Pastor Dave to come and, and guide us as we pray together. Thank you, Pastor Wayne, and good evening, church family. Uh, it's a privilege to be able to pray with you tonight. And I would just invite you, if, as we lift up the, the prayer requests that have been shared with us, if you have your own concerns, things that we can pray together about, seek the Lord together about, that you would share those with us. You can put those in the comments simply as you're watching this. Or perhaps you want to email them uh, to prayer at mrbc.us. You can also send them there, and we would be happy uh, to pray together for your requests. Uh, but let us join our hearts together and seek the Lord's will concerning uh, these petitions, these requests this evening. Would you pray with me? God, we come before you tonight, Lord, knowing that, that you indeed are good, that you are holy, uh, Lord, that your name is the name above all names. And Lord, as we seek you tonight, we... We are confident that you can ask and do, um, Lord, everything that is according to your will. Lord, you can supply our every need according to your riches and glory. So, Lord, we come uh, just dependent upon you during this time. Uh, Lord, we ask for your will to be done above all else, that your name would be glorified. Uh, Father, as a people, as a church family, uh, Lord, I pray that we would always speak well of your name. Lord, that we would recognize that we bear your name both in our speech and in our actions. Lord, that as we are called Christians, we bear the name of Christ. Lord, that, and so, Lord, may everything we say and do always bring honor and glory to you. May we uh, repent and turn away from anything that would point things at ourselves or at our own ambitions. But, Lord, may our ambition always be to glorify you. Father, may we bear your name well, uh, your holy name. And recognize that we as your holy people are called uh, to be set apart in this world. Father, I'm thankful for my brothers and sisters this evening. And, and I want to lift up each of us uh, to, together tonight, Lord, from our, our children to our students to our adults. God, may we all bear your name uh, and recognize that we are called to live holy lives. Lord, I pray that as our children continue meeting, Lord, you'd protect them and and guide them. I pray that they would gain your heart, that those uh, within our fellowship and, and within our groups that have yet to know you would come to know your saving grace. Lord, that they would be raised uh, in your nurture and instruction in their homes. 
Lord, that they would be led by parents who, who know and love you. And, and so, Lord, they're led to love their children well, to love them toward your kingdom. Father, I pray for our students who are, who are continuing to grow and learn of you, who are, uh, who are growing in their capacity of their understanding and gaining authority in their own life to exercise, Lord, your plans and your purpose for them. Lord, I pray their, that their hearts would be sensitive to your leadership as you guide them. Lord, that they would be uh, just grounded in your word. They would be drawing near to you in prayer. Lord, that you would show them the plans that you have for them, that they would take those plans one step at a time, recognizing the opportunities that you have set before them with their friends, with their family, uh, with their neighbors, Lord. And may they honor your name. Father, I thank you for our, our adults and in our, in our fellowship. And, and Lord, as, as you have sent them out into this world as your ambassadors, Lord, I pray for your constant guidance Lord, that, that the authority that you have given to them in Jesus' name would, would just be exercised in such a way that they are faithful in making disciples. Lord, you've called us to make disciples. Uh, it starts in our homes, it, it, but it goes beyond that, Lord. It goes to our neighbors and our, our workplaces, to our family and our friends. Lord, help us to be faithful with the authority that you've given to us as your church. Father, as, as a church family, I, I pray for the needs that are... Um, in our church. Lord, we lift up our brothers and sisters to you tonight and just are asking that you would be with them in their need, in their times of sickness, and their times of grief. Lord, we lift up to you Dale Williams, who has a, an appointment to remove a cancer growth tomorrow. I pray that you would grant grace to him and to the doctors who will be performing that surgery, that they would be able to take it off of his ear without complication, and that it would just be a minimal, minimally invasive, Lord that you would be present with Dale and with Noreen during that time. Father, we pray for uh, Jean McGill, who's going to see a surgeon on Friday. Lord, we just pray that you would uh, just grant clarity in the outcome of the, the results of the MRI. We pray for your healing hand upon her. Lord, we pray that you would uh, grant her your peace in this time. Father, we ask that you continue to be with, uh, with Larry and, and Willie White. Lord, we just pray for their continued recovery from this virus. And, and Lord, pray that as, as Willie remains in the hospital, that you would encourage her daily uh, while uh, she remains isolated. And, and Lord, just help her to be patient. And Lord, we just look for your hand of healing on her. Father, we, we lift up to you to um, Dave and Susan Pike as they grieve the loss of Dave's brother, Gary. Father, we pray your hands and your arms of comfort would wrap around them, that you would encourage them. Hold them close to you, Lord, and let them know of your love. Father, we lift up Steve LaPan to you and just ask that you would help him in his recovery uh, from his, his leg being injured in a fall. God, that you would grant him grace, be with his family during this time as well, to help them through this, this trial. Uh, Father, we continue to lift up to you uh, just our sister Jan Monday, just be with her and, and the different doctor's appointments she has. Lord, we pray for uh, your strength to be with her. Lord, you'd continue to be honored and help her to see each moment uh, how she can use those moments for you. Father, for our brother Jason Kogelman, just continue to be with him as, um, Lord, we know he has this uh, diagnosis of a degenerative eye disease. Lord, we're praying for uh, just a stop of the progression of that disease. We're praying for your healing hand. We're praying for wisdom for his family that you would show them how to navigate this difficult time. Father, we lift up Pam Denise to you. Uh, we just ask for continued uh, progression in her recovery. Lord, we pray that her treatments would be effective for her cancer. And Lord, just that you would speak tender words to her and encouragement uh, throughout this time. And Father, for John Lewis, we lift him up to you. Just ask that you would continue to encourage his faith as he battles different health, health issues. And we, we pray for... Uh, healing in his life, Lord. We pray for uh, encouragement of faith. Lord, we pray for wisdom for those giving him care. And Father, we lift up our, our nation to you. Lord, we as a people know that, that today is a significant day as a new president's inaugurated. And, and Lord, we just ask for wisdom and guidance to our nation's leaders. Father, we pray that you would guide them, that they would be sensitive to your leadership. Uh, Lord, that, that you would be honored in our nation. Father, that we as a people would, would recognize our responsibility to uh, 
um, to uphold the laws in our, in our land, to, but to, that our laws would, would honor and glorify your name. Lord, we pray for that from our, our state to our nation to our local leaders. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would guide their hearts. And Father, we lift up to those who continue to provide care for us in different ways, whether it's uh, the, those in, in the medical field, doctors and nurses in our church family. Uh, we're praying your protection on them as they serve those who are ill, uh, that you would protect them and that you would minister your grace through them to those they meet. And Father, we're praying for those in, in also in law enforcement and, and emergency services like fire and uh, EMS. We just ask that you would uh, just protect them as they serve you. And Father, that you would uh, just use them for your honor and glory in their places of service, and that you would bless and protect their families. Father, we just thank you for the privilege of, of serving you. Uh, help us to be faithful. Help us to, to look toward you with hope and confidence of the day of your return. And Lord, may we be busy about your work of reaching people with your good news and helping others grow in faith. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Brother Dave. And uh, uh, it's, it's such a blessing to be able to pray together. I miss so much uh, being able to pray with you in person and certainly look forward. We pray that the day is soon when we can do that again. Certainly enjoyed this past weekend being able to be with uh, our men at the men's retreat. And the, the highlight of the retreat is gathering together to pray for one another. It is to be such an important part of who we are in Christ that we share in this, uh, this privilege to be able to enter together into the presence of the Lord in prayer. Uh, we desperately need it uh, to pray for each other. And, and speaking of prayer, uh, Sunday, if you're not able to join us, uh, I encourage you to go back and, and listen to the message as we talk about uh, the role, the relationship of prayer and godliness that we're seeking to grow, uh, to begin a new chapter in our lives by beginning a new chapter of faith in godliness. And, and prayer is, is such a key. And, and really in sharing that message, the Lord really stirred my heart. I was uh, intending to, uh, to, to look at one of the other disciplines of our faith uh, next Sunday, but there's so much more to be said about this life in prayer. And we're going we're gonna to focus on what Jesus has to say about prayer this Sunday. And so I invite you to join us Sunday um, in preparation. It, it would be very helpful if you, if you watch or listen to the message from this past week because uh, it'll be a kind of an addition this week to what we've already said about the, the nature and the importance of prayer in our lives. And so I invite you to, to join us on Sunday as we come back, uh, as we both gather personally and virtually uh, to hear from God's Word. Let me pray for you as we're dismissed. May God's mercy and grace be upon your life. May His Word dwell in your heart richly that you would meditate on it both day and night. And may His invitation the invitation to his presence leads you into his presence regularly, continually in prayer. And may the fruit of your prayer be the intimate relationship you have with God that would lead you to peace, the peace of Christ in your life. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful night.